Shall we have a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning on bend and knee. Because, uh, Lord, we're not worthy of being in your presence. But Lord, as we study your scriptures, you are a God of love. And you just want a relationship with us. We thank you for bringing your son into this world for uh, set an example of, and reveal your character. Lord, help us and teach us how to hear your still voice. Lord, please take a coal from your altar and touch my lips and permit me to speak about holy things. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. You know, in a way, it was nice to see the snow falling this morning. Because how boring would it be just to have one season? Nothing coming anew, fresh. And it's, I was really surprised to see how fast the grass withered away in this cold weather. And it just reminds me of just give it a few months and we'll be back to a different season. I'd like to share something this morning that as Maribel and I were driving here, we were listening to uh, some Christian uh, Christmas music on the radio. And I want to give you a line this man came on the radio and said. And it kind of, kind of got us thinking. He said, this is the time to say peace on earth. And when we heard that, we began thinking that this Bible verse came into our mind. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. The Bible says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And for some odd reason, I feel like everything we see in here is saying, don't worry. Everything will keep on going as it is. So I'd like to begin with a question this morning. How is our world right now? When I look at this world, when I see the way things are heading in this world, it kind of makes me realize that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from this earth. And I don't know about you, but just by watching everything and the surroundings, you just get that, that kind of uneasy feeling. But we also see that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the people, even from all the churches worldwide. I have a caption up here that I've had in my computer for a little while, and I've been waiting for the time to present this. And the caption says, sure glad the hole is in our end. <laughs> you have two men that are comfortable sitting on one side of the boat, and two men down in the water saying, it's going to sink. It's going to sink. And you kind of wonder, and this I'm guilty of this, how often do we see these fires out in California burning people's homes? These tornadoes, these floods. And you say, I say, wow, I'm glad it's not at my doorstep. But, if you realize it, we're all in the same boat. That's pretty scary when you think about that. 
But let's look at this spirit. Let's look at this picture spiritually. Let's say these two men on one end. Let's say they're Seventh Day Adventists. And here we have two men down in the water trying to bail water up. They're struggling. They don't have no way out. They're trying to bail water out of that boat, but there's a hole in there. So we know the boat is going to sink. So we see others that are dying without the truth. And we have a big responsibility that God gave us to give the three angels messages. It's time, brothers and sisters, to get into the water and give a life-saving message that we've had the past 172 years to a dying world. I'm going to read a quote from the Review and Herald. When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation, and it becomes an abiding influence. It must be attended with divine power, or it will be accomplished nothing. We see here that this message should be preached with divine power, or it won't accomplish nothing. According to this quote, should we be preaching the third angel's message right now? Absolutely. It's not time for watered-down messages in Adventism. It's not time for feel-good, everything's going to be okay messages. It's time for us to preach the third angel's message with love. Review and Herald, August 19, 1890. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time, and, like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. So we see here that this parable was pre present truth in 1844. It is present truth right now and will be present truth until the close of time. Amen. Just like the three angels' message, so it must be very important. In early writings, page 63, there are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the message running off from the important points of truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Satan here will take every possible advantage to injure, injure the cause. So what is present truth? But such subjects as a sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is. Establish the faith of the doubt and give certainty to the glorious future. These, I have frequently seen, were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. Here we see it. The sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. These are the points of present truth that perfectly calculated to establish our faith. So the question is, are we Seventh-day Adventists living 2016 giving heed to these messages? <clears throat> we have a message that should be given to the world. We have been given that responsibility. Now when we talk about the ten virgins, this parable is given immediately after Jesus tells his disciples the signs of the end of the world. Let's go to our Bibles and let's study the message in Matthew 25. 
I'm sure that you've all heard this parable many times. So I hope you can see this with fresh eyes today. In Matthew 25, verse 1 and 2, thing that the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. So these are pure women. These are Bible-believing women. They have the right knowledge of the Word of God, and they understand the three angels' messages. They know that Jesus is coming soon. They take their lamps and they study them, and they are waiting for Jesus. These are Seventh-day Adventists, Bible-believing people. If we stop here in verse 1, we would say <coughs> that this is a powerful church ready to meet Jesus. But in verse 2, Jesus says, that there are five wise and five foolish. How is it possible to have the Word of God and understand the Word of God and still be foolish? I've always wondered about that. Jesus says, it's great that you are all waiting for me to come back, but some are foolish. Let's move on to Matthew 3 through 5. But when, they, but when the foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps, and the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. So five virgins took no oil with them. Here we have half Adventists that have the lamp of truth, but if we don't have the oil to soften our character, our truth turns into a weapon to be people with. We could be foolish when we have the truth, but, the but we need the transformation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Review and Herald on August 19, 1890, the state of the church represented by the foolish virgins is also spoken as the Laodicean state. Revelation 3.17, if you say, I am rich, I have a required wealth, and do not need a thing. <coughs> but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. These represent, represent a class of Seventh-day Adventists that say, I know the truth. I am good because I have spiritual wealth and knowledge of the Word of God. If we don't have the oil of the Holy Spirit that softens our hearts, we'll be like the foolish virgins. So how do we find that connection? Let's turn to Proverbs in our Bibles. Proverbs 8, 17. The Bible says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. So it's a connection. It's a connection with our Creator, the one that made us, the one that died for us, Christ Jesus. And there's a promise for us. He will meet with us in the morning. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 4.16. Father. 
We need that, that spiritual connection so He can impart His Spirit upon us. In Review and Herald on August 19, 1890, in the parable of the virgins, Cut off on that screen a little bit. The parable of the virgins, five are represented as wise and five are foolish. The name foolish virgins represents the character of those who have not the genuine harbor wrought by the Spirit of God. The coming of Christ does not change the foolish virgins into wise ones. When Christ comes, the balances of heaven will weigh the character and decide whether it is pure, sanctified, and holy, or whether it is unclean and unfit for the kingdom of heaven. So this is talking about character. What is my character like? And i got to tell you, I'm preaching to myself this morning. We all need to study our character and pray that Jesus changes us so we are not foolish when he comes back for us. Otherwise, he'll tell us, I don't know you. This is in Christ's Objects Lessons, page 411. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. But they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen on the rock Jesus, Jesus Christ, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. This class is represented also by the stony ground hearers. They receive the word with readiness but they fall of assimilating its principles. Its influence is not abiding. So we need to let the Holy Spirit in our hearts to change our characters. If I am looking at someone else and thinking that they need to convert their characters, this means that I have not pleaded for the Holy Spirit in my heart. And as the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and became drowsy and slept. So how many became drowsy and slept? Oh. They all became drowsy and slept. Notice that they were all virgins, and they all had their lamps. How is it that you can be smart and yet sleepy? I've always thought, was thinking about that. Because the delay was so long, we start to think that Jesus will delay much more. And we're sleeping, waiting for the return of Jesus. There is going to be a national Sunday law. And coinciding with that, there will be a latter rain and a loud cry, which will lead to the close of probation, which will lead to Jacob's trouble. But when the Sunday law comes, it's the defining time for us. Now something now, something is going to wake the church up. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. In Prophets and Kings, page 626, Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. In this preparation, they should make by diligently studying the Word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. The tremendous issue of eternity demands us something besides an imaginary religion, a religion of words and forms, where truth is kept in the outer court. But God calls for a revival and a reformation. We know that the trigger is going, what the, we don't know what the trigger is going to be, but it's going to be some kind of crisis, some kind of trigger that will lead to the Sunday law, and when that happens, everybody's going to be awake. In Testimonies, 
from the church, volumes 8, page 28. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world. And great terror is soon to come upon the human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. So are we preparing ourselves for that overwhelming surprise? We should have a daily living connection with Jesus. His character should be reflected in our lives. In Christ's Objects Lessons, page 412, it is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bride and groom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The sleeping virgins were aroused to their slumbers. It was seen who had made preparation for the event. In a crisis, character is revealed. And we see that every day. Some people are just running to and fro. They don't know what to do. If we fall apart every time we're tested, We'll be tested again and again until we're able to hang on to Christ. Then be prepared for that overwhelming surprise. How many of us feel like we've been tested and tested and tested? We prepare by studying the Bible with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and communicating with God every day so He knows us when he comes back. Amen? Amen? Pleading for the transformation of our character so it is abound according to his kingdom. Both parties were taken unaware, but one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without preparation. So now, a sudden unlooked for calamity, something that brings a soul face to face with death will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. To go through the crisis is hard, but it refines us. Let's read from our Bibles, Matthew 25, 7-9. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answer is saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, rather for the dealer, rather to the dealers and buy go to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Our perfection of character is individual. Our pleading for the Holy Spirit is a personal task that we each have to take on. Our Bible study, our communion with God through prayer, is all individual. In Matthew 25, 10, while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And what happened? The door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. So why did he know the foolish virgins? Because they didn't have the true relationship with him. We might know the story of the Bible, but we also need to have a personal relationship with the author, Jesus Christ himself. So my message today is, keep your lamps full of oil. The Lord is coming soon. Amen. 